Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to uh, NPTEL MOOC course in Phonetics and Phonology, a uh, broad overview. We are continuing with uh, Phonology and this is the second week of Phonology and uh, we are discussing features. We discussed features quite a bit in the last lecture. Also we are following up in this lecture and showing a few other features which were uh, not shown very much in the last lecture. So, uh, going over what we did in the last lecture, feature theory is uh, part of a general approach in cognitive science which hypothesizes formal representations of mental phenomena. Hence, we see representations and we saw those representations of these formal objects and we saw what the different uh, features are and why they are considered representations etc. in the last lecture. And in this uh, lecture, we will uh, go into feature matrices a bit more and um, also show that uh, what we learnt in the last lecture that how we can represent a rule using features and if we use more pertinent features then our rules give us more general ideas about phonological processes happening in the data. So, in the last lecture, this is what we had shown with regard to stops and fricatives that both stops and affricates are within the natural class of minus continuant whereas fricatives fall within plus continuant. And on, on the other hand, affricates and fricatives fall within the domain of plus delayed release and stops alone belong to the natural class of minus delayed release. Also, we uh, looked a bit at vowel features like backness and height and tenseness. So, these are all vowel features and also uh, we looked at all the different combinations of features which lead to the different vowels that we have. We have seen in all the previous lectures in articulatory phonology also and uh, the tense and lax vowels differ phonetically. The lax vowels tend to be shorter and more centralized and the plus tense vowels diphthongize towards a higher vowel and minus tense vowels diphthongize with an inserted schwa as in bait. So, we have uh, seen the feature chart for vowels in the last lecture. So, let us summarize the vowel features and show you uh, what are the combinations of features that gives us the particular vowels. So, we have plus high, minus low, plus tense and then minus high, minus low, minus tense would give us this contrast here. And similarly, depending on whether the vowel is front or back or round or unround, round or unround, we can show the vowels in a matrix like this. And then we have the unusual vowels like these vowels, vowels which are minus round yet central. So, central vowels are represented as minus front and minus back which means they are neither front uh, nor back and whereas uh, oo these are plus round and plus back vowels. So, these are the plus round plus back vowels. These are the minus round vowels and we also have the rounded and unrounded counterparts of um, the vowels e and u and so we have these vowels which are this is minus round and this is also minus round but this vowel is front and this is not uh, the front counterpart whereas this is the front counterpart which is round for e. So, we have all these uh, vowels which are possible in the languages of the world and hence these symbols corresponding symbols which are there for all these vowels are remembered for transcription purposes and uh, that is something this few of the familiar vowels we know the transcriptions for instance the schwa is written like this 
the a vowel is written like this but some of the vowels which do not exist in english like this vowel which is minus front minus back yet uh, it is plus round and uh, which means it is a, a centralized uh, a plus round vowel and this is a centralized minus round vowel so all these vowels are not very common in the languages of the world so we may not know their uh, transcriptions very well but these are given here okay so ipa provides the three mid central uh, vowels these are the mid central vowels which is this vowel this is the schwa and this is the a and central unrounded vowels and the feature system uh, permits only two but we can uh, show them with the additional features in uh, ipa r designates the lowest possible front vowel lower than a and in feature system this sim symbol is deemed un unnecessary for the purpose of phonology most of the time a is used for lowest front unrounded vowel and then there are other vowel features like advanced tongue root which is uh, very much seen in the vowel harmony systems of the world so all the vowels in a particular word must be plus atr or minus atr and that is called vowel harmony so basically all the vowels will be plus atr plus atr plus atr or there will be minus atr minus atr minus atr and when this happens when one vowel makes a change of value in all the other vowels then that is called a vowel harmony system and in vowels uh, three more features are relevant for vowel inventories and this is these are long and nasal and stress so vowels can differ on the basis of length so we have in english itself we have ee e, and we have a long uh, u and o and a and a and then uh, the other feature uh, is that of nasal vowels can be nasalized it can be shown with the nasalization symbol and then uh, vowels are also stressed so they can they, the vowels bear stress in a uh, language so we have the major articulator features and after the vowels now let us have a look at the major articulator features and the major articulator features are plus labial plus coronal and plus dorsal and dorsal are those consonants which are articulated with a tongue body and coronal are those features which are articulated with tongue blade and tip and labials are articulated with the lips so often a consonant is made with just one articulator so it gets the value plus for one of these features and minus for the others in uh, complex segments two articulators are involved and they are represented like this with a symbol like that showing that two articulators are involved in the production of that segment and these are not two different segments so this is the one and this is shown with this symbol and clicks which we looked at a lot in the uh, articulatory phonetics section so uh, clicks involve tongue tip we saw that clicks could be uh, based on uh, because we saw when we were looking at clicks we saw that clicks have two places where the occlusion occurs so one of them could be tongue tip blade the, it could be dental it could be a bit more back so they could be either plus coronal or plus dorsal along with being a click sound and a uh, classifying place of articulation by the choice of active articulator of receives confirmation from phonological pattern of languages and we saw that uh, a little bit in the last part of the lecture on uh, features that you saw in the previous lecture on features and uh, the plus coronal defines a phonologically relevant class of consonants and uh, the definite article of classical arabic al appears before various stems in context like this and showing that there is only one uh, feature class before this so we saw that what's the purpose of of features that with the purpose of features is that you capture the idea of a natural class that rules uh, processes in phonology are happening not in a vacuum but because there are natural classes which are the targets of rules and processes and um he so here all but dentals alveolars and palatal alveolars pronounced as a copy of the are uh, pronounced as pro copy of the following consonant geminate so except dentals alveolars and palatal alveolars 
all others copy the following consonant. So that is why this can be ex expressed like this with a uh, that, th that is the context. So now what is the environment for germination? So we have all these um, environments here, we have the, the, the nas we have dentals, we have alveolars, we have also nasals and we have approximants and these are all uh, coronal or dental. So uh, they could be all expressed with one feature if they belong to one natural class. So instead of the whole purpose of doing feature theory is that instead of putting down an inventory of sounds, you have to capture the generalization of why a process targets all these sounds and always it seems that it is it's not random it's because the sounds belong to uh, a phonologically relevant class of consonants and that phonological relevance comes from feature theory. So coronal consonants are classified using four features anterior, distributed, strident and lateral. So we saw a bit of this in the previous lecture also. The word anterior means towards the front and anterior coronals are articulated at the alveolar ridge or further forward, interdentals and alveolars. And minus anterior coronals are articulated behind the alveolar ridge and palatoalveolars and retroflexes. So minus anterior plus anterior plus distributed minus distributed plus trident minus trident and plus and minus lateral. So there could be eight ways in which you can express uh, coronal consonants. So we saw plus uh, anterior and minus anterior plus anteriors are uh, interdentals and alveolars minus anteriors are articulated behind the alveolar ridge mostly palatoalveolars and retroflexes. And anterior defines natural classes in the process of sibilant harmony. In sibilant harmony, all stridents in a word are required to agree in anteriority. Again, when phonological processes happen, it targets only uh, groups of sounds and, and very often that groups of sounds have some phonological regularity and that regularity is seen from the lens of features, can be explained from feature theory. And if we talk about distributed, we have plus anterior and minus anterior coronals uh, can be made with uh, either the tongue blade or tongue tip and laminals are counted as plus distributed, apicals counted as minus distributed. And plus distributed is um, when we have the blade of the tongue and minus distributed is when we have the tip of the tongue. So distributed involves what we uh, studied before. Remember when we talked about articulatory phonology, we looked at the linguistic diversity in the languages of the world and we had looked at laminals versus apicals. So uh, laminals are the consonants and laminals can be both dental and alveolars and apicals can also be either of them and whereas one involves the tip of the tongue and the other involves the blade of the tongue. So plus distributed is uh, uses the blade and minus distributed uses the tip. So laminal and apical can be understood in terms of feature theory as plus distributed and minus distributed consecutively. And uh, dentals and palatal alveolars are normally laminal, then alveolars and retroflexes are normally apical. So laminodentals are all these which are these uh, dental stops, fricatives and then dental nasal and then we have the apical alveolars and um, then we have palatal alveolars and then we have retroflexes and uh, palatal alveolars fall within minus this anterior plus distributed category and retroflexes fall within minus anterior and minus distributed category. So the difference between palatal alveolar and retroflex is that is in terms of distribution a feature of distributed, one is uh, retroflex is minus distributed, palatal alveolars are plus distributed. Similarly, laminodentals are plus distributed and apical alveolars are minus distributed. The other category relevant for coronals is strident. Plus strident sounds are the sibilants such as sir, z, ch, uh, j, sh, j, ch, j, and only coronal fricatives and affricates 
uh, can be plus strident. And uh, plus strident uh, the air stream is channeled through a groove in the tongue blade and blown at the teeth. So, basically uh, strident sounds cannot be pronounced if the front teeth are missing um, in a person. So, it is a bit of a trivia because the air with great force is channeled and it has to hit the front teeth to produce the special effect that a strident sound will produce like s or z. Strident sounds are louder than non strident fricatives or affricates. We had seen the acoustic properties when we had looked at uh, acoustic properties of sounds of different sounds like fricatives and stops. We had seen that the fundamental frequencies uh, show that not just the fundamental frequency, the noise created because of production of stridents are different for different stridents for different fricatives and uh, for sir versus sh and versus f. All these sounds which are fricatives have their noise component and it can be identified in a spectrogram. And again, uh, even in the phonology, strident sounds behave differently because they are louder than non-strident fricatives or affricates. And the allomorphs of the plural suffix identify uh, the class of stridents. So, for instance, in English, as uh, so, whenever the last consonant is one of these stridents, it's always um, the plural is glasses or mazes or bushes or garages, batches or judges. And English employs schwa insertion to break up clusters and so um, uh, before a strident a schwa is inserted and then we have this form. So, lateral, lateral distinguishes le from other coronal liquids and um, there could be lateralized fricatives like a coronal fricatives. In a lateral sound, the tongue is compressed laterally so that contact at the edges is incomplete and in this state air can pass laterally around the tongue. So, that is what lateral means that there is two sides and that is why um, in lateral sounds uh, air can pass from both sides of the tongue. And in features such as round or labiodental, uh, round is produced by rounding the lips and then labiodental uh, which involves the lower lip touching the lower lip to the upper teeth. And then a few languages uh, have phonemic contrast based on labiodental and like Spanish f versus f and v versus v. And then we have labialization where even a stop sound can have a secondary articulation of labial and then it is represented uh, like this as a superscript and can be treated by adding the features plus labial and plus round. So, um, in place features for consonants, they are plain labials, they are plain labiodentals, they are rounded labials, they are rounded labiodentals, they are rounded velars, they are labial velars and they are rounded coronals. Features used for classifying the dorsals, the dorsal articulator is also the primary articulator for vowels and uh, fronted velars uh, are there. So, this is the subscript used here to show that this is a fronted velar and as in kin it is fronted because of front vowel and then central velars like English collect because of the following central vowel. And back velars as in ku are produced a bit back and uvulars uh, which are not there in English at all like r and o are have their special symbols. And then we have the pharyngeals which we studied when we looked at linguistic diversity. These are the two symbols for the pharyngeals. So, secondary articulations are such that they are shown with a superscript like this like y or like r or this pharyngeal sound or the labialized sound and additionally uh, these are the features that they have because of the additional secondary articulation and the appropriate feature values are added to the base segment. So, that is how secondary articulations are represented in the phonology. So, a uh, place as a group concept, the system of features should not be treated as some homogeneous collection, but something which has some internal structure to it. And an interesting aspect of many phonological rules is that they manipulate 
all the feature places at once. So in Spanish and many other languages when unlike ne assimilates in place, in place to the consonant precedes. So no matter what place it bears, so it just um, it is a complete change to the place of the consonant it precedes. So if the previous consonant is um, it preceded it is preceded by pa then it can become ma which becomes bilabial if it is a ka it can become nga because uh, the, because the vila are etc hence we have a data like this where um, as we just said depending on the feature of the consonant it can change to a labial or a labiodental or a dental or alveolar or palato alveolar or velar so, hence uh, data like this have to be represented like uh, in this way. So, where um, the nasal takes the place of articulation of the following consonant. So, whatever the place of articulation of the following consonant, if it is nasal, or if it is uh, velar or palatal velar or dental or labiodental, it just takes that exactly the same place of articulation. So, complete replacement of the same place of articulation and that is why it has to be indexed with i. The indexation means that whatever the place of articulation of this is, this will just change to that. Voice, a voice defined articulatorily as involving vocal cord vibration and acoustically as involving the characteristic periodic waveform that results from this vibration and we have seen the category voice and its articulatory as well as uh, acoustic properties in the previous lectures. And voice defines a phonemic distinction among obstruents in the majority of languages. And voice is seldom phonemic among sonoran consonants and never phonemic among vowels. So the contrastive feature for voice in sonorans and vowels is pretty restricted. And then we have a plus spread glottis is when the vocal cords riding on the arytenoid cartilages place relatively far apart producing a wide glottis and plus spread glottis is present for her for breathy vowels and aspirated consonants plus spread glottis sounds are normally voiceless but do occur voiced example the voice allophone of her in english and her between two vowels so uh, they are normally voiceless but also do occur voiced as in the English examples we have seen here. And in um, plus constricted glottis, it is the opposite of the spread glottis involves uh, the arytenoid cartilages placed relatively far apart producing a wide glottis and pushing out a lot of air. And then uh, in constricted glottis, we have the adduction of the vocal cords to make a narrow or closed glottis and in plus constricted glottis sounds include the glottal stop and ejectives which we have seen in the articulatory phonetics diversity in the world's languages classes lectures. Preglottalized sounds like the allophone t at the end of English cat and then the ten stops of Korean which have glottal closure but are not ejectives. So these are preglottalized or ten stops. And then uh, implosives, which we have seen a bit in the previous lectures. Implosives um, involve a special articulatory gesture in which the larynx is lowered, creating temporary partial vacuum. And then in the feature system, the value 0 can be assigned to features for which a segment can be said not to care. So in the tongue body does not adopt any particular position uh, during the per. The per here could be said truly not to care about the values for dorsal features. And the notation here is simply null. So it's either null back or null front or null high or null low. So what does null mean? It does not care. So in the zero there is assigned features which is the feature does not matter. So norans are assumed to be zero delayed release and low vowels are assumed to be zero tense because Low vowels never uh, contrast for tense and uh, sonorants never contrast for delayed release. Features versus phonetic symbols. Fully phonological analysis of a language would use no phonetic symbols and only the feature matrices have theoretical status in a language and the phonetic symbols are meant only as convenient abbreviations for particular feature matrices. 
ways in which rules benefit by writing them with features. So, we have seen a bit of this in the previous lecture. We will again show a little bit of Indonesian data where there is ng deletion. Uh, so, ng goes to null in the presence of a following minus syllabic plus sonorant. And then uh, to capture assimilation, we write rules like this vilar fronting. So, vilar is represented as plus dorsal minus plus consonantal, it becomes plus front and minus back, and that is how we express vilar fronting in English keel or gale or dinghy. To show that a change is minor, that is of only one or two feature values, so, and then uh, if a rule changes only changes per to per, one would write per goes to plus voice rather than per to per, showing that nothing changes other than voice. So, uh, how do we find the features needed in a rule? To find the particular features needed to define a natural class, it helps to start with the complete set of sounds in a language. So, then we have to just use enough features to take away the sounds not wanted, leaving the target natural class in place. And to describe the class of Clydes, we can use minus syllabic to take away all the vowels of a language. So, once we say minus syllabic, then vowels are not there in the natural class. Then minus consonantal get rid of all the non-glide consonants. So, there are good reasons to include only just as many features that are needed. So, in English all voice fricatives can be realized as voiceless at the end of an utterance. So, safe and bathe and maze etc. And uh, final fricative devoicing can be just shown as plus voice going to minus voice at the end of an utterance. And simplifying rules through vac vacuous application, fricative devoicing can be made even simpler. So, how do we make it slim simpler? We just say that sonorants, minus sonorants uh, become voiceless at the end of an utterance. This rule would apply to voiceless fricatives and devoice them. So, basically we are not saying anything about the voicing of the voice property of minus sonorants because we want to show that it loses the voice. So, this would also apply to voiceless fricatives and uh, devoice them. By saying this, we mean that there is no change at all basically. So, how are rules matched up to forms? All features or segments are not changed by a rule are assumed to remain the same. Two adjacent feature matrices in a rule can only be matched to two segments which are adjacent. So, this rule of locality is important. Vowel nasalization does not apply to Whitney. Why not? Because there is a T in between. So, adjacent features. While it is necessary to match everything in the rule, it is not necessary to match everything in the form. So, if a rule matches up to more than one location in a form, it applies to all such locations. So, the goal of characterizing natural classes is that are broader than the IPA categories. The feature sonorant stops fricatives, affricates are minus sonorant and all the sounds are plus sonorants. In Spanish, Japanese, Swahili and other languages, the class of stops, fricatives, affricates bears the phonemic contrast to voicing. Many languages have a voicing assimilation rule uh, and a consonant is assigned the same voicing as an immediately following consonant. And the set of triggering consonants and those which undergo the rule are restricted to class of minus sonorant. In many languages, example German, Dutch, Russian, Polish and Catalan, there is a rule of final devoicing. So, minus sonorant goes to minus voice, the end of a word. And ng is deleted from the Indonesian prefix meng in, the, in case the following sound is a consonant other than a stop, affricate or fricative. So, ng is deleted in, in the, from the prefix in case the following sound is a consonant other than a stop, fricative or affricate. So, another name for that uh, for those sounds minus sonorant obstruent. So, ng is deleted from an Indonesian prefix mung in case the following sound is a minus sonorant or obstruent is a rule. The sonority hierarchy which we have seen in the previous lecture also. Uh, since the work of Edward Sievers in 19th century, phonologists found it useful to arrange the manners of articulation in a hierarchy based on the acoustic loudness of sounds and this is called the sonority hierarchy. So, greater sonority and less sonority. 
vowels, glides, liquids, nasals, obstruents is a hierarchy. The natural classes found in phonological rules consist of some contiguous set of manner types drawn from the hierarchy example vowels, glides and liquids. So, uh, non-contiguous sets like glides, nasals which means here glides and nasals are not contiguous you have liquids between them then they never pattern as natural classes. And to capture this pattern four features are adopted sonorant, syllabic, consonantal and approximant and this is the sonority hierarchy. In this system all of the contiguous sets along the hierarchy are expressible as natural classes, glides, liquids and nasals with the formula minus syllabic plus sonorant. So, vowel is plus syllabic, glide is minus syllabic minus consonantal, liquid is plus consonantal plus approximant, nasal is minus approximant plus sonorant, obstruents are minus sonorant. So, this is your most important traditional manner categories. Syllabic consonants, every syllable has a nucleus which is its most sonorous segment. Segments forming the nucleus of a syllable are classified as plus syllabic, the remaining segments is minus syllabic and syllabic liquids and nasals occur in many languages example Serbo Croatian trug or square or the last sound of English button. So, here consonants like uh, syllabic liquids and nasals are the nucleus of a syllable. So, uh, syllabic liquids even though they are liquids and um, consonants they will have the feature of being plus syllabic. So, syllabic fricatives and stops are quite rare they um, occur in languages like Berber and some Slavic languages and syllabic glides are the same thing as vowel syllabic e ear is rather strange way of describing the vowel e and rotasized schwa is used an equivalent of syllabic r. The sonority hierarchy expressed with the manner features has a role of governing the legal sequence of speech sounds. Example languages which permit clusters of consonants at the margins of syllables. So, this is a word trance where vowel is the nucleus and we can see the sonority is increasing with the placement of the liquid after the obstruent and sonority has to decrease now ideally in the end of a consonant and we have trans uh, and then we have a uh, nasal here. However, the S in um, English uh, does not follow the rules of syllabification in English because we have many clusters in English which start with sa and sa has greater sonority than uh, the obstruent for instance t. So, in that way for instance t is violates the sonority hierarchy and uh, because this is more sonorous and the sonority should increase, but it is considered to be an exception. So, this holds true for over 99 percent of the world syllables and there are some exceptions like Slavic languages and Persian have some syllables whose segments occur in orders going strongly against sonority hierarchy. And then uh, we have continuant which is most important uh, when we talk about stops, affricates and nasals. So, what is minus continuant? Stops are minus continuants and all these are belong the category of minus continuants and fricatives, liquids, glides belong to category of plus continuant. Delayed release, stops are minus delayed release, affricates are plus delayed release. So, this is revision of what we have seen already. The feature uh, can be phonetically uh, defined with the criterion includes frication noise. So, um, we have come to the end of discussion of our discussion on features. So, I will say a few words about um, something called markedness. So, there is considerable uh, evidence suggesting that features are central to speech perception and speech processing. Two basic properties of speech perception are categorical perception which we have seen in our lectures on categorical perception and normalization that is listeners abstract linguistic information from irrelevant acoustic variation. So, a newborn and very young infants perceive and process speech in terms of broad phonetic categories that correspond closely to the distinctive feature categories of adult sound systems. Infants gradually fine tune their perceptual system to that of the ambient language and after this speech perception is largely shaped by distinctive features of the first language and adults continue to perceive speech largely in terms of 
distinctive features of their first language. So, there is a considerable amount of evidence suggesting that in cognitive terms, adult phonological representations have the form of feature based representations which abstract away from fine phonetic detail. Features also make predictions about types of sounds. The type of sounds of a language at the levels of lexicon and phonology are defined by its active features and their possible combinations. And uh, features make strong predictions about the number and types of contrasts a language may have. For example, major place of articulation in coronal sounds is defined by two features, anterior and posterior. So, dental alveolar versus post alveolar retroflex palatal uh, these can be divided along lines of anterior posterior or minus anterior plus anterior and apical distributed uh, apical including retroflex versus laminal. So, we have seen these differences and we have also seen the difference between apical and the laminal anterior retroflex post alveolar etcetera. So, uh, phonetic theory by providing a much larger set of different place distinctions within this region. Uh, projects a much larger number of contrasts. However, uh, phonology uh, predicts the uh, right number of contrasts which are available in the world's languages. So, maximum number of sounds and contrasts predicted by a, um, a feature system recognizing two coronal features here and b a traditional phonetic theory recognizing seven coronal categories which we saw in our lectures on uh, articulatory phonetics where we saw seven coronal categories, but if they were all present then the max number of contrasts should have been 21. However, the phonology um, shows the right number of contrasts and the, the, the feature system predicts the right number of contrasts. So, all six contrasts predicted by feature theory are tested in both simple plosives and affricates. So, these are the uh, different languages which we have also seen in our previous lectures in the distinction between apical versus laminal, apical versus retroflex, laminal, apical palatal, laminal versus retroflex, laminal, palatal, laminal versus palatal. So, feature theory predicts because of these categories post alveolar, retroflex, lamino anterior and apico anterior which can be divided along the lines of plus distributed, minus distributed we will get only these features, we will not get the 21 predicted by the distribution according to phonetic detail. So, I will conclude this lecture with a word on markedness. So, markedness is understood here as the system of avoidance of certain widely disfavored feature combinations and uh, markedness counteracts the free operation of feature economy. So, in the absence of markedness, sound systems make use of n features would be expected to display the theoretical maximum of 2 to the power of n features, but no languages come anywhere close to approaching this maximum because theoretical maximum because of number of features which you can have 2 values. So, everything would be 2 to the power of n and but no languages come anywhere close to approaching this maximum instead segments are characterized by marked feature combinations tend to be absent. So, feature combinations which are difficult in production in articulation are absent in the languages of the world and uh, so and ideally one would like to be able to predict the degree of markedness of any given feature combination from the general uh, phonetic conditions that underlie the human capacity for speech production and the problem is that phonetics provides an extremely rich set of interacting principles which frequently lead to some conflicting expectations. So, for instance plus minus voice which feature which of this feature is marked in stops. So, plus voice is marked in stops because it requires supplementary maneuvers to maintain the aerodynamic conditions required for vocal cord, but also minus voice could also be marked because it requires very precise temporal coordination of uh, articulatory structures laryngeal and oral. So, no independently motivated general principle appears to exist that would allow us to predict the preference for one of these statements over the other in all cases. So, a feature is unmarked if it appears in sound inventories of all languages, otherwise it is marked. So, marked features in consonants plus all languages have obstruent consonants, some lack sonoran consonants. So, all languages have coronal consonants, some lack these 
labial dorsal pharyngeal or laryngeal all oral consonants uh, but can lack nasal consonants stop consonants but can lack continuant consonants and aspirated stops there are unaspirated stops but aspirate can be missing non glottalized can be there glottalized can be missing anterior coronal stops can be there posterior can be missing non strident coronals are there strident coronals can be missing and simple consonants but articulatory consonant secondary articulations are maybe uh, not there in many languages so why the occurrence of uh, feature is unmarked if it occurs in the sound inventories of more languages uh, then it's contrary otherwise it is marked so this is something we can assume to be correct for languages that the more a feature is preferred in languages the more unmarked it is so voiceless obstruents occur in 99.1% of the upsid languages while voice obstruents are found only in 84.3% of them so minus voice is unmarked plus voice is marked this part of the lecture was prepared with help from uh, this paper by clemens 2004 So uh thank you for your attention and we will continue with phonology in the following lectures thank you